to pick up Professor Marvin Morris, our um, poet laureate, who is here. Pick up Marvin. You have been very important to me personally in my career because of the work that Marvin did on Louise Bennett. He made it possible for me to do the work that I do on the DJs. I know you will not take any responsibility for the SNAP scholarship in which I have engaged. But in fact, it was by opening up that space to take the oral and the popular seriously that I was able to do the other work that I have been able to follow, you know, following this tradition. I just want to read a little bit about Tanya from the Poetry Archive because I think it says that whoever wrote this said it well. Tanya Shirley is a startlingly bold writer with a particular gift for highlighting the telling detail in her vivid and arresting poems, which variously contain portraits of lovers, colorful eccentrics, and family snapshots that capture the elusive magic of childhood memories and reveal those paradoxical truths which all families strive to conceal. Born in Jamaica, this talented young scholar poet graduated from the University of West Indies, where she now teaches between times spent elsewhere in the Caribbean and the United States. She was an awarded an MFA in creative writing from the University of Maryland and has published work in journals like Small Acts, The Caribbean Writer, and in the volume New Caribbean Poetry, an anthology edited by Kai Miller. And so much things to say, 100 Calabash Poets. She's a Carve Canem Fellow and has participated in Callaloo creative writing workshops and more recently read and taught at Narrating the Caribbean Nation, a conference come festival held in the UK to celebrate the 25th anniversary of People Tree Press, her publisher. Her debut collection, She Who Sleeps With Bones, was a Jamaican bestseller in 2009, which reflects both the popular appeal and literary merit attached to these unusually frank and often personal poems. And her second collection, Tanya, you have to remind me now because it looked like I never printed the whole of this thing. <laughs> the Merchant of Feathers. A lovely title. So please give a warm welcome to Tanya in celebration of this national relationship. Thank you all for coming out today. I know I'm just the appetizer <laughs> and we eagerly await the entree. So I will not be too long. I want to start with a Recently, I found out that a writer's group that I belong to in the States, recently I found out that one of their faculty members um, was sexually harassing women for years and no one wanted to speak out and they just started to speak out this week. And so it's been really resting on me because that was one of the spaces I considered to be a safe space. And so as women, it's International Women's Day, I mean, I'm glad that we have a Women's Day to remind us of our importance to society, but I wish we didn't have a day where we had to be reminded. But on this day, especially, I'm thinking of all the women who live in fear and who live in silence. A chant against fear. Fear of recovery, fear of memory, fear of the boogeyman who lurks behind bushes, on moonlit streets, in bedrooms, in stories. Fear of your mouth, fear of your tongue, swollen and numb. Fear of lizards, fear of ships, fear of dead fish, fear of getting lost in your mind. Fear of fat, fear of your bones, fear of your fist, fear of drums, fear of dreams. Fear of your own coming. Fear of the man beside you on the plane, fear of germs in the air, under your nails, on your bed linen. Fear of mold, fear of heat, fear of drought, fear of storm, fear of forgetting your favorite color, your name, the names of your lovers. Fear of mirrors, shadows, lakes, puddles. Fear of footsteps, fear of the Bible, fear of the radio, fear of the bird's song, fear of the hour before dawn, fear of begging and beggars, fear of dying, fear of falling, fear of fear of fear. Affair. And of course, I'm borrowing from the African tradition of chanting, uh, thank you, of chanting as a way to, of uh, as a way for protection and healing and restoration. I'm also I've also been working on a series, as you can see, I'm not the slimmest of women, so I've been 
That's when you say no. <laughs> so I've been working on a series of poems about the, the, the female body. Um, yeah, about the female body. So I will start particularly a certain kind of female body. So I'll start with this one. Don't let the fluffy fool you. Where I come from, fat women are called fluffy. A word conjuring cotton candy and clouds you can sail on to see Jesus. We the fluffy women of this island, famous for wood, weed, and water. Do not hide under rocks or play timid like the shame lady. We are a chorus of puffed up sparrows whose hips chirp as we swish and swish our fluffed up feathers in every parish. Local songs pit us against our slimmer counterparts. Stage shows have dance contests between Mampi and Maga Gyal, and always we hold our own. The fact you find here is flexible. We are supple wood and undulating water. We wind down to the ground and split. Our legs stretch like spliffs. We bend over, bend over, front ways and back ways. This body is not a prison. This mouth knows food was meant to be eaten. Where I come from, fat women are called fluffy. A word less loaded, more buoyant, not stern like corpulent or obese. Fluffy conjures pillows cradling lottery dreams. Fluffy says, come rest here in the billows of flesh. Fluffy says, you better know how to ride these waves or you shall sink alone. <laughs> we, fluffy women, do not drown in the world's disdain of fact. <laughs> curse word in it. I hope you won't find it gratuitous, but every now and then a woman has the choice to reach for a word that is the only word appropriate. <laughs> this poem is Imagining the Body. My six-year-old niece says she wants the magical ability to make it okay for everyone to walk naked outside. Her father says, if we don't wear clothes, we'll be arrested for indecent exposure. The term stumbles on her list as she learns the consequences of legislated shame. My husband cannot watch TLC's My 600 Pound Life. He says the body is on display for the disdainful gaze. I change the channel to suit him. Sacrifice the pleasure of eating my supersized sandwich while watching these people who make me feel slim. I write poems in praise of heavy women, but I am guilty of drawing a line between beauty and the grotesque. Who told me where one ends and the other begins? I measure bellies against whales, thighs against seals. The body should not spill over airplane seats. I used to fit in one digit sizes, wearing my hunger as a badge of honor. I took that injection to scare away sperm or whatever it is birth control does. And soon I was storing fat and I said, fuck it. Let me see how far I can spread. How many people I can piss off with this new body bigger than their dream of me. Men made my breasts into lost mothers, fell asleep on my belly and isn't that where the spirit lives? But all this was behind their girlfriend's backs. A girlfriend once told me she liked her fat man doing her from behind. His belly slapping her backside added another dimension to pleasure. A man's belly is a full safety deposit box, a sign of good living. If all of him is too fat, then some woman failed him and he earns the world's pity. But an obese, an, a, but an obese woman should have known better, should have closed her mouth and not let the whole world in. Um, and this one, I went to the, I know, 
Professor Edward Ball has an embassy poem, Kai Miller has an embassy poem, and so I thought, oh, why not? So I was at the embassy, and you know, when you're sitting there, because of course the injustice of you having to wait all day, you know, you eavesdrop, and I heard these women talking, and I made it into a poem, and it's entitled Crossing Over. Happy to see a familiar face in this freezing embassy waiting room. You stretch across the road to hug her. A woman older than Methuselah, who asks about your children. You tell her the big girl is in England, but the two other girls in America, but the other two girls in America, two married, one going to school, all three have children, nice healthy children. She asks about your husband. Him die, you tell her. You tell her he wasn't even sick, or if he did sick, he never said, because as she know, he was a quiet man. You tell her you were to take the grandchildren back up to Florida on the Thursday. Your suitcase was packed, US dollars in your purse. And on the Tuesday, you were sitting on the patio talking to a neighbor, swatting the Portmore mosquitoes that descend like a plague in the evening hours. Your husband was in his bed watching the local news as he did every evening. Your neighbor saw her daughter come home from work, so she got up to go share out her dinner. You went inside to go sit side by side with your husband, but you find him sprawled out on the floor. Feet crossed at the ankle, his arms crossed over his chest, looking peaceful as peaceful can be. You shake him a little, but no response. You call your son to bring the bay rum, you rub him down, but he was as dead as dead can be. You had to cancel your trip to Florida. You tell her it's two years now since that happened. And in the same monotone voice, you ask her what she been up to, if she's still attending the church across the way, as if your husband didn't just die in the middle of your life together, as if he didn't just fall to the floor like a John Crow feather. You tell her you have a new pastor, a man they brought up from St. Thomas. And I wonder, is so your faith strong? Is so your days belong to the concrete slab of an upstairs church? that you can bring up your husband's death like a leftover meal and pick up right where you left off, as if his life was always waiting in the balance, always one step from falling to the floor. And of course, I wrote that, woman to ha that poem to highlight, and to highlight the resilience of women. That, you know, I'm sure she grieved for her husband. She would watch the news every evening with him, but him dead. Well, you must do. Yeah, the embassy waiting for a new visa to go for real. Life moves on. And I'll read maybe one or two more poems. Um, this one is called, said by a DJ at an uptown dance. And I'm grateful to people like Bob Andy, who I'm sure he doesn't want to claim any part of this poem. But I'm grateful to people like Bob Andy and the music. That as a Caribbean poet, I have access to the music. I can tap into the music, and I can make it a part of the written word. Broke off your head, me bite back a morning. And what is a woman's head but dispensable? A dirty whining machine, a hypnotist string, a windmill. I want a man so rich that when my head comes and goes, as it often does, and doesn't come back again, or when he grinds me into salt, or when his single eye sucks me in, he can go to the store where women's heads are sold and get me a new one. A man so accommodating that he will love me even in my new-headed body. I imagine all new heads go through a period of adjustment. During that time, he will settle for deep discussions with my breasts and marvel at the acquiescing nature of my tender parts. Matter of fact, which woman really needs a head? unless she is proficient in giving head and keeping her mouth shut when she's not. Mr. DJ, two headless women were found in Spanish town. Kindly give their families some money and directions to the store. Thank you, you've been wonderful. Sacrifice. 
There are women who stand in doorways their entire life. They cook, clean, bring up children, cry out to God from the narrow space that separates them from the world of runaway men. Uh, and I would like to conclude by giving Bob Andy a copy of my first collection, uh, so I will bring it to you. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the And now, I must big up Dr. Velma Paula, I didn't know, it's also in the audience who could just as easily have read on this occasion, but I just want to big up Velma for being one of the women who has really been a very powerful force. I'm sure Tanya will acknowledge that women like you led the way for her to become a writer.